Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Fuck, it is just one of those days on yeah. the show today. My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael, and uh, we got some movies yep. coming up on the show. So we're doing The Fly. Yeah. That's that all that needs to be said. Uh, well, we're going to do Altered States first. This sounded good on paper. It looked good. We had a, a mad scientist day, you know, scientists experimenting on themselves and dubious science and some other, uh, another theme that we'll get to that might be a spoiler. Um, I love to see crazy scientists at work. As I go to see the increasingly depressing Iron Man films, I love the part yeah. where Tony Stark builds things. I like engineering, and I thought, you know what? We would sit down and play with wacky science, and that would be great. But then what happened is The Fly is just so good, and Altered States... I mean, we could not We could have a debate over the merits of Altered States, uh-huh. but I don't know if that can even... That's not even a possibility anymore, right? Yeah. So then there's this issue of... What do we what do we watch first? Which film do we I think the best we... way to go about it is to do altered states first and give that, you know, give that our best shot before <laughs> right. we go into the, cuz if we do the fly first it's going to be one of those things that people always bitch and moan. What do they call it? 12 minute 12, 12 minute, minute yeah, films? 12 minute is that films. what they call it? Yes. Yeah, we've got coined derogatory <laughs> phrases now. Thanks Podman. That's it. terrible. Yeah, well sometimes we do a film that we know is going to be much heavier than the other. And we do that specifically so we don't have to sit in the studio for two hours talking about movies. You know, like we gave people fucking The Shining and Bright Falls to start the year. That show was like two hours long. I mean, I don't know. So they're not happy. But yeah, you're right. We would not be... Once you get to the end of The Fly, you don't want to talk about altered states. Mm -hmm. And right now, I'm in kind of that zone that uh, post-Hostile 2 zone where I just had this fucking experience... And to try and articulate that now would, uh, I mean, that would give the fly the credit that it's due, but I'm not sure that's good radio. So why don't we just be excited and make jokes about LSD for about 20 minutes, and then we'll talk about the fly. Sounds good. Um, you can use the chapters to uh, skip between the two movies, and there's going to be spoilers. I'm um, going to be a lot of spoilers, but apparently everyone but me had seen the fly um, I saw it, uh, I guess, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, and was not aware that it was one of the top 10 most viewed films of all time. So also insightful things Eric has to say about The Fly, probably zero. So there's going to be spoilers, there's chapters, and there's going to be some altered states. Can I start altered states with a question for you? Yes, ask away. Did I spoil this movie for you? No, I still don't. When we sat down... I mentioned to you, you know, we watch uh, a lot of the movies we watch. We've both seen a billion times now. And we're watching the movie in the company of others. Everybody's seen the movie except for you. Except me. And I turn to you and I go, hey, we kind of got another theme here, don't we? Body horror. Um, Something I knew we would return to with a fly, but not with altered states. And you sort of say, I don't know, do we? This is maybe 10 minutes into the film. Uh, How do you feel about that? I did I ruin that for you? No, because I don't I you know there is no way to spoil this. The movie does such a damn good job of confusing you and making yeah. it so that even it so essentially if you were to tell me flat out this movie ends with William Hurt turning into a one-armed blob <laughs> right. while his wife is a lava chick screaming at the end of the hallway and then they hug, rekindle their love, and explode into light beams. Into the credits. If you were to tell me that around the time, you know, he's talking about, you know, I need to try this new trip that they're doing down in Mexico. If you were to tell me where the movie ended, that wouldn't spoil it. That would because, mean nothing to you. Because... How the fuck do you get from where <laughs> right. where the film starts to where right. the film ends? The answer lies somewhere in the film. You and I don't have that answer. No. So the best way we can tackle it is tackle the drug shit. Basically, uh, what are we going to call it? Pre-prime and post-primal man. Okay, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll tackle when it's dubious science and then when it's clearly not science at all. When it's run 
far, far away from science. The other thing I told you is that there would be a monkey in this film because yeah. I wanted you to have a good time. That and, was a lie. And there was actually not a monkey. I had but to wait whole, all the way until the other film. The whole time you're thinking, maybe there'll be a monkey. Maybe he'll turn into a monkey. I mean, I think when I said that in my head, I went, shit, did I just spoil this movie for Michael? But then I said, this is a movie about a scientist who submits himself to drugs mm -hmm. all of the time. So even if he's not going to morph into something, even if there's no transformation, you're going to see some kind of bad things are going to happen to yeah. his body, basically. So this was a movie that was supposed to be directed by Arthur Penn, whose, uh, most, inf whose uh, most important film was Penn and Teller Get Killed. Uh -huh. Although he also did this thing called Bonnie and Clyde that a lot of people like. Arthur Penn didn't do the movie. Instead, Ken Russell did it. Now, normally, you might be expecting me to go on a long-winded rant about Ken Russell and all his films and what he does and how awesome he is, uh, much like we did with Cronenberg uh, sure. back when we did the Cronenberg show. Instead, I think all you need to know about Ken Russell is just go to Google, type in Ken Russell, and click the images, and just look at photos of Ken Russell. He looks like an insane person. And that's all I know about Ken Russell. And I think that's all our listeners need to know as well. I mean, that that's about right. Yeah, I, I mean, I know. I don't, I don't even think I... showed I, you the, the, I the crazy barely, picture on I was, IMDb. Okay, right? so you were trying to get me to look at background stuff on this. So what you didn't understand about me watching this film is that I had never seen it before. Yeah. And that furthermore, you didn't explain to me why it was on the show all you said was you know that thing from fringe where they're in the sensory deprivation tank yes this movie did that so i'm watching the film you're trying to show me pictures of the clownish director <laughs> over to my left and i'm wondering how much of this film is a drug trip is the whole thing him trying different hallucinogenic drugs and is the whole film going to grasp at you know, strands and threads of a tattered scientific cloth with all these new black bean soups that he's trying yeah, to right. trip him into ape world. Or yeah, how many peyote trips happens. will he go on is really the question. Uh, yeah, there's there's two moments early in the film where you just see his drug trip out. And so if I'm hearing you right, your concern was that those drug trips would not end and that would be the rest of the film. Yeah, that I, would be an extremely bad time. I didn't know what so I was So you're scared out of your mind. Yeah. You're looking at your watch and go, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is fucking what, 2010? Yeah. Well, we don't have watches. Looking you're looking at, at your phone, phone and going, I have another hour and 10 minutes of drug trip. And we've, we've decided, I don't know if it's been made clear. We should probably say this once, at least on our show. We try not to bust any films anymore yeah we try we did that year one when we were both experiencing films for the first time now sure. even if we don't like the film we're trying really hard not to destroy films we're not trying to tear them down because if we're doing a film on the show it has to have merit we're yeah. doing it for a reason and furthermore a lot of people come to the episode someone will listen to this episode because they really like altered exactly States. and they don't need to hear us bitch about why it wasn't for us and i didn't want to sit there watching these drug trips i was trying yeah. so hard to go okay uh drug trips and i guess yeah so the fly is this mad scientist and and maybe it's about lack of control what is oh no and i'm panicking <laughs> thinking yep. what does eric want me to do and then you you start freaking out and accusing me of wanting to watch the film well that was my reaction is in my head i said what do i do my defense mechanism kicked in and i turned to you and said michael why the fuck did you make me put altered states on the show you'd never even heard of this thing before so that was actually not the case but uh, but all, then I felt better when I had tossed the blame onto you right. and it was no longer my responsibility. And that's all over just the beginning portion of the <laughs> yeah. film. This so, is all the first. This is what a sober person's trip is right. like. For everyone else who just gets high and watches Altered uh -huh. States, this is the perspective of two completely sober people worried that they have to do a show after I'm the going, movie is I'm, over. <laughs> I'm sitting literally seeing the first... I think the first drug trip is the one where it keeps cutting to the scene where they're eating the ice cream in the pasture. Yeah. And I keep going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. There's symbolism here. What the fuck? I don't Something's know symbolism. Happening. If, where no is one, it? if no one has a gun for a leg, I don't understand the symbolism. Yeah, that's about it. And I'm panicking because a lot of this and I, I was trying to figure out whether you wanted to go the route of. This isn't science. We need to make fun of it or go the route of Timothy Leary had a good point, right? Drugs are cool. Yeah. We should legalize drugs because those are both points that we would make. Pseudoscience is bullshit. Legalize drugs. Yeah. That's kind of those are two big staples of double feature. 
I wasn't sure where you were going. I wasn't sure if you were going to ask me about the ice cream they were eating. I do have notes in front of me, so I think we can give it the good old college try. And I know you're not familiar with the college try, but I'll show you what it's like. The college try for me is two years of being bored until you drop out. The first point, blah, blah, William Hurt, right? William Hurt's from Body Heat. William Hurt was on Dark City on the show. He's in AI. Come on, you like AI. Yeah, he is in AI. And His he's in History of Violence, minuscule. as we've, we've tagged way too many times on this show. That's not true. I tag it again and again. Uh, also, the film debut of one Drew Barrymore, who, yeah. see if you can even fucking find her in the movie. Yeah. Well, Pretty sure she's the little kid. She's got to be. Yeah, it is. she's the daughter. It's kind of like the spot um, Elijah Wood's first film role in Back to the Future 2. The Cabinet, right? With the gun, gun cabinet with the not. That is so the, Elijah Wood. The arcade game? Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. Those are called cabinets, by the way. I arcade didn't know cabinets. That. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. The deprivation chamber is the icon of the film. Mm-hmm. When you think altered states, you sure. think LSD, deprivation chamber. Uh, you should be thinking prehistoric monkey man. But what you think is deprivation chamber, I guess. Fringe took that for its opening episode. But Altered States is something that when Fringe was kind of pitching itself as the X-Files meets whatever meets Altered States, I mean, that was one of the uh, the staples of the show. Fringe is an awesome sci-fi show sure. that's on well, TV. borrows for- one of the actors from Altered and by borrows, I mean completely steals and usurps the actor because the actor no longer belongs to Altered States. Yeah, it's Blair Brown as Nina Sharp uh, in Fringe, not as Nina Sharp in Altered States. Also, Blair Brown, kind of naked in this movie. Yeah, I had this weird... So both of these films kind of put me in weird positions, but specifically Altered States, I was knowing that Blair Brown was Nina Sharp and going, I like her as Nina Sharp. She's a very strong female role. I love Fringe. She's young here. Please just show me her body. Yeah, that's a bizarre age you and I are in. Uh, We're, what, 14, 15 years old? Yeah. (laughs) So it is so wrong when Nina Sharp could be our great-great-grandmother. And uh, no, I mean, she's probably old enough to be our moms, sure. right? That's uh, yeah. what is she in her? I don't well, That's a terrible thing to do to an actor. I'm just not going to do that. But, uh, you know, altered states, she is a lot younger. And suddenly you want to see someone naked who you recognize as being an old person sure. first as, right. you know, their current age. It would be like looking at, see, I don't know what Jane Fonda looks like today. But we did Barbarella, and uh, we were just both having a great time. Jane Fonda, Barbarella, but it's back in the seventies or even sixties, right. right? Yeah. So uh, Jane Fonda today, it's a I weird, mean, it's a weird thing where you're trying to figure these out. These are more sober people head trips we're exactly. having here. Okay, so all actress nudity aside, for now, this film kind of parallels the Timothy Leary story, which is that college professor. This is the the LSD guy that everybody knows, right? Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure he invented the fucking shit. And he gives it to all his college kids, and he's kind of watching them trip out, doing it, quote, for science. It's also the 60s, so he's doing it, quote, for fucking fun. And that's the first thing I saw. I see LSD for science, and I go, this is Timothy Leary. And you start, you know, you start kind of revealing more of your research. You've done far more research on this film than anybody in the history of... It's true. You're it's bring, so, this is what you're bringing. So if very you can't true. bring the fly, you are bringing altered states. Yeah, so you right. tell me, no, it's not Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary is small potatoes compared yeah, right. to how specific this film runs. Well, everybody talks about John C. Lilly, who I knew before, not for his drug research, although that's, you know, funny in its own way. But he he was the guy who tried to teach dolphins to talk. So, uh, I mean, how do you not know? <laughs> Hold on. Michael has fallen on the floor of the studio. <laughs> Sorry. Just pick yourself back up. It'll be fine. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Right. I'm now going to tell you something completely amazing. I'm not joking. He was really trying to teach dolphins to talk. That is a real thing. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> Thanks to my clever editing, people won't know that's the ninth time you've said that's fascinating. All right, just settle down, take a drink, you'll be okay. So uh, his he used isolation chambers all mm-hmm. the time. Isolation chambers and LSD were the tools uh, that he applied to his so-called science, mm-hmm. which we'll get to in a moment. But uh, I'm going to take drugs and float around in a pool. Not much of a scientific hypothesis there, yeah. huh? So the hypothesis lies in in an arena where I think you are far more comfortable than I am. I mean, we've talked in the past about my feelings toward philosophy, okay. and that burgeons on my real kind of discomfort, and that's existentialism. Yes. I I learned that back when we did, what, Memento? Yeah. Or, or no, it was being John Malkovich, I think. Uh, yeah. I 
hate existentialism. <laughs> right. It's so disinteresting to me. I don't care. I, I, I don't need other people telling me why I'm here, why we're here, the capital we. I don't need to know any of that shit. And this film is not only discovering existentialism, but doing so through the power of hallucinogenic drugs. Yeah. And the whole goal, the whole theory, the whole hypothesis is that, okay, plus side, there is no God. The God is the self. Whatever. Fine. Thank you. The problem lies in the fact that the other part of the hypothesis is that we are made up of six billion year old atoms. And so we're essentially made up of the same shit that the first monkey was made of, which was the so, same shit. So as we Mr. should have that memory, right? Right. That's, well, that's the hypothesis of the that, film. It's anyways. that memory is our energy and energy is stored in atoms and molecules. And we should have trilobite memories. And the only way to tap into that is is getting some of the sickest fucking peyote you can from some crazy Mexicans. So I wish I could tell you, uh, first of all, I don't think that's a scientific theory anywhere, but in the 60s and 70s, it probably was. I'm really curious if there is anything we've really learned from all of that time spent in isolation tanks. And I'm not a scientist. I know a little bit about science, but I wish I could just come on here and say, come on, guys, LSD, isolation tanks, you are not scientists. You're fucking frauds. But maybe there was something that was gained from that. I just don't. I'm too ignorant about the topic. What I will tell you is from everything I know about science today, isolation tanks, LSD, and talking to dolphins, no longer a part of science. So if those were once important tools, I don't think we're using them a whole lot anymore. What it does tell us about is drugs. It tells us about drugs more oh, than yeah. anything else. It does it. It tells us what. Here's exactly what this experiment, this observation, not an experiment, no hypothesis. This is an observational study. It tells us what a man sees when he hangs out in a pool on a bunch of LSD. Yep. That's all we get out of that experience. Now, I'm not saying that's completely useless to science because, hey, that's more knowledge. It's sure. what's going on in that man's head. We can hook that man up to machines and see how his brain functions mm -hmm. under those conditions. We can see, you know, what parts of the brain are stimulated. Right, we right. We can see whether it's more of a long-term or short-term thing. We can see if there's negative effects on the long-term yeah. or short-term. There are some really practical uses to taking drugs and monitoring what happens after. Unfortunately, I don't think that borders into how people are put together. It doesn't no. border into... Cellular reconfiguration, yeah. which is another theme in today's show, but this time in such a disgustingly <laughs> ill-educated way. It's one of the um, – if you were to build a timeline of the relationship in movies between science and nonsense and your comfortability level, something Fringe played around with. Yep. Uh, I know you and I talked about that. Man, when that show first came out, every episode we would reconvene and have an hour-long meeting before Double Feature and say – is this okay? Is the show going in the wrong direction? Is it promoting pseudoscience? And you get to a point, a point we get to in this film, where you're traveling into, uh, I don't want to say anything about Fringe, but Fringe comes to a point where it is, it's Star Trek sci-fi at a, at a certain point. Yeah. So you realize we're not really trying to play in the realm of science or say anything about science. We're inspired by science. We like it. We're using it as a set piece mm -hmm. in our film. Here, when we start talking about philosophy and religion, we run into a lot of trouble. I mean, if you want to talk about religion and drug studies, it's exactly the stuff uh, you were just mentioning. You know, recently drugs have been used in research to uh, compare to, I mean, you could look at if the reaction of X event, how that compares to the reaction of a person's brain on drugs, how a religious person's brain, for instance, compares to that of someone who's experiencing some kind of chemical high. There's research to be done there. I don't think there's research to be done there in the film. I mean, pseudoscience aside, this is a guy who is experimenting on its, himself. Mm -hmm. I think anytime you're experimenting on yourself, that's a red flag that you are committing some bad science well, right especially now. Especially if your colleagues are so adamantly against you. And in this film, okay, so the one guy who's the whole time saying, you're crazy, you're going you're gonna to kill yourself and mm. I'm going to have to commit you. He ends up being wrong and he ends up, you know, fucking eating his hat, whatever. Yeah. But, but he's there. I mean, he's that's there to say for it. people like us dissent. who go, wait a second. All right. So I think we've made our point. Edward Jessup certainly can't learn anything about the origins of man by hanging out in the tank. What effect do you think that plays these uh, dissenting viewpoints by the time 
you know, you, you talked about that character eating his hat. Once he turns into a monkey, what are the implications from the standpoint of that character? I mean, I guess he gets a brief moment to say, I told you so, but he also just once. Okay. Once he turns into a monkey, the film takes the turn where it's no longer an examination of science through the power of drugs. It's no longer using hypothesis to come up with at least some kind of, even if the film wants to make a hypothetical theory. Yeah. The film turns into a plain and simple sci-fi. It's almost Stuart Gordon-esque. Yeah. Where there's a lot of interesting makeup. Everybody around kind of turns into a potential body count victim. You know, that character specifically, the dissenting scientist, he's there. He gets to say, I told you so. But then immediately he's thrust into the role of you'd better survive, motherfucker. Because there's a monkey monkey. coming after you. Yeah, right. You know, I'm uncomfortable with the science until it's crazy. And this is the point when it's crazy. At least once it's crazy, I kind of know where I'm at. Right. Then we're being chased down by a monkey and that's fine. That's what kind of movie we're in. But uh, I wish the film had a buildup that would let me appreciate it more because when the monkey busts out of the tank, that is some of the scariest, most what the fuck. Can you remember in recent memory any film that has had a longer period of what the fuck for a single scene? I mean, he, he busts out of that tank, which is kind of frightening, by the way, because you don't expect to see that. And he is, it's actually kind of terrifying. He's chasing people down the hall and he's really, really fast and it's not William Hurt anymore. It's some guy in a prehistoric monkey suit. And you have no idea what you're getting into. And as this keeps going, I mean, he breaks out of the facility. He goes to the zoo and what's an oddly uh, comedic scene. Eats a deer. He hangs out with some rhinos. But this scene is going on for what must be 20 minutes. Yeah. And you're just saying, what the fuck is happening? Some films will give you a momentary you know, minute long, what the fuck? I can't believe this is happening. We'll see some of that in The Fly. This film just continues to run with yeah. it, and you don't know. I mean, you, you're not comfortable again until the monkey goes away, and then you can kind of stop, regroup with everyone, and say, okay, guys, what just happened? What did we just see here? That's kind of the blueprint for the rest of the film. It, it, it goes through different versions of the same kind of thing, where something fucked up will happen to Edward. You're, you're wondering, you're left wondering okay, where's the film going? If he turns into a monkey way early on, you realize his experiments are successful or a failure, depending on how you want to look at it. Sure. But where is the film winding up? What you didn't expect is, one, that he turns into a one-armed blob man. Yeah. But more specifically, there is true love, even for a one-armed blob man. It turns out to be a study of the relationship between these two characters and how one is so driven to take drugs And how the other one just wishes he would stop because she's afraid he'll hurt himself. But eventually we see one of their asses and it's glorious. See what I was talking about though? Now we're we're discussing the fly and everything is fine. I'm having a Mm -hmm. wonderful time. We're all okay. So the fly popularized be afraid, be very afraid. That's how big of a film was. That fucking phrase came from this movie and I had no idea. Uh, This is a Cronenberg flick. We talked about Cronenberg at length on the Scanners and Eastern Promises episode. Yeah, this is Cronenberg and his element, too. Oh, for sure. A lot of the fucked up shit is just really well delivered. Yeah, this is probably his masterpiece, right? I mean, this is high up. Maybe. As far as the sci-fi stuff goes, the really heavy... This is the top of the old Cronenberg. You know, I I'm, I hesitate to ever say one of his films are the best because I'm not going to pretend that I understand mm-hmm. everything he does in his films. But what I do understand about this film and about David Cronenberg is that he's in this film. And no, I don't mean his cameo as the gynecologist. No. I mean that Jeff Goldblum's character, Seth Brundle, I feel like that is just David Cronenberg putting himself in the movie. He acts the way David Cronenberg acts. If you've ever, have you ever seen interviews? No, I haven't actually. He's, he's kind of this, he's, he's always got this nerdy appeal, but right. he's, he's never, he's never owning the nerd. You know, yeah. he's never awkward and weird. He's always, yeah, I'm nerdy, but I also have this fantastic vision yeah. and it's going to revolutionize film. He's sure, always, sure. he's always on what he's doing. He's always so sure that what he's doing is the right thing to do. And that's what Seth Brundle is. Seth Brundle is this scientist. The first thing, really, the earliest thing that comes out of his mouth, I'm working on a project that's going to change the world. Yeah, right. Unapologetically. He's not joking. And he says it over and over again because he wants to be sure 
that it's not a pickup line, right? Yeah, it's right. not a fucking pickup line. He's not just there to fuck Gina Davis. I'd fuck Gina Davis. But what he is there for is to prove that he is the motherfucking master of science that he knows he is. Right, right. Or science fiction if you're David Cronenberg. Yeah, we should talk about um, the treatment of that a little bit. At the very least, you've seen Videodrome yes. if you didn't grasp it all, and I certainly don't grasp it all either. But a lot of the appeal of Videodrome was long live the new flesh, uh, the idea of flesh versus man, of flesh versus machine. And that really heavy flesh versus machine stuff comes back right in the beginning of The Fly and I guess is even sort of the end of The Fly. Yeah. It's one of the more subtle themes that's kind of lost under all of uh, the makeup, frankly, yeah. under all of the disease and under all of the body horror and under all of the transformation. You do have um, that theme as well, just in the computer stuff. I mean, we know that Cronenberg loves to show off his 80s computers, but the computer is a character just as much as the three main actors. You're always going back to the computer for references. The computer's telling you how it's, you know, I mean, he talks to the computer in this movie. Right. He's literally talking to the computer. So there is that relationship there, too. So if Jeff Goldblum is a uh, character in the movie and the computer is a fucking character in the movie, then you also have Gina Davis, as you mentioned, who plays Veronica. And I think, you know, the, the fly transformation is the main thing sure. at the heart of the movie here. And we'll talk a lot about that. But before we pass it up, Veronica has her own really fucked up moment yeah. in this movie. Toward the end of the film, you find out that Veronica is impregnated by either Brundle or Brundlefly. Yeah. You never find out which, and and it's the source of many convoluted sequels, which hopefully this show will never have to cover. Yes. Actually, you know what? I'll make you a deal. Altered States 2, The Fly 2. Fair? <laughs> yeah. No. Get away from me. Well, what happens is she finds out she's pregnant and then she goes and she takes a, you know, a little mommy nap as pregnant women probably do. I don't know. I've never hung out with a pregnant woman. All right. But what I do know is that she has a Cronenberg dream. And I mean this in two senses. One is it's fucked up air David Cronenberg. Yeah. And two, David Cronenberg is her gyno. So she's delivering the baby and she starts pushing, you know, the, I mean, Birthing scenes for me are horrific anyway. Yeah, yeah. So she's screaming. There's doctors everywhere. Machines beeping, overhead lighting. Everybody's in scrubs. There's blood on people's hands. You're not sure if it's the safe kind of blood. That's one of the things that always yeah. gets me. Is it the safe blood, right? And he says, oh, okay, there's more. Yeah. And what does that mean? You start to panic. The sound kind of starts to get yeah, a little bit more yeah. overwhelming. And then she gives birth to this giant fucking maggot oh, into God. the arms of the director of the film. Oh, Jesus. And it's, it's so writhing horrible. in his hands, covered in the safe blood, the dangerous blood. You don't know. And yeah. she's screaming and she wakes up screaming and the whole audience is screaming. And she decides she's going to abort the baby. It's great that Cronenberg realizes the fly is the main attraction, but can also make us venture off feel safe is something we talked about when we did 28 weeks later yes a movie that makes you feel like here's what's scary let's go off over to the safe territory just have a oh a little safe abortion scene you know no big deal and then that turns out to be disgusting and awful too the final character is stathis borans right who is just ellis He's from, ellis from die, die hard that's it period if we compare the handling of the sci-fi element in this movie to that of altered states I think we have a, a formula that's a little bit more careful and something that protects the movie. There's all this magical science stuff going, the engineering right, stuff, you know, right. the Iron Man stuff that you mentioned. And it's cool. And there's all this new, new scientific stuff. There's a right. book being written. Jeff Goldblum is a maniac, but with a scientific drive. And really suddenly he turns into something out of the thriller video. <laughs> yeah. And it's really sudden and it's really quick. And you realize, oh, we're not going to explore the telepods anymore. Yeah, and, yeah. and you'll, I mean, maybe it's just me or maybe it's just a small sect of the audience, but you can attest. I'm sitting there every time something happens, I'm sitting there wondering what happens if you put this in the telepod. Sure. Right. What happens if you put these things in the telepod. Right. Right. Well, the crux of his entire problem, I mean, he wants to remove the fly DNA. If the machine breaks him down atom by atom and then rebuilds him, if the machine can also identify the fly DNA, the fly DNA, there you have A plus B equals C. I yeah. mean, he should be able to reverse remove, it. Maybe that's A minus B equals yeah. A again. It's is kind of the point. He should be able to just extract the fly. So what the movie's saying right from the beginning 
is that scene, you know, build me a laser this, molecular yes. analyzer that. He's saying, I'm a scientist, but only kind of. Well, Other people build my stuff, and I just throw it together. Don't ask me how this works. Essentially, and again, this is Cronenberg at his finest with his kind of airtight thing where he goes, the guy running this machine doesn't understand how it works, and the guys that understand how it works don't know he's running this machine. Therefore, nobody has all the answers that you're asking. Right. And unfortunately, this is the only event where the machine was used, and so these are the only answers we have for sure. But it still unfolds at a pace where it kind of gives you answers the whole way through, but it never answers all the questions at a given point until it's over. The Cronenbergian, all your answers finally come in, but the film is over now. Yeah, you realize what he's becoming. And throughout the entire movie, that's what it's a story about. It's not a story about how do the pods work. Although Cronenberg loves, again, the machines. He loves to show you the pods he loves to show you the talking computer, the monitors, the devices, the pods full of smoke, but he wants to make that seem like magic. He wants that to be the fantasy element of it. There's a magic pod you go into, and some stuff happens, some smoke comes out, all magic. He can call it science, but he doesn't want to explain it so we don't run into problems sure. like altered states. So before shit gets really bad, Brundle and Veronica have this beautiful conversation at this burger place, and they exchange this line of dialogue that is how I would describe Cronenberg to anybody unfamiliar with his work. And that is not while we're eating. Yeah. I think Seth is a great example of the body horror stuff. Um, he's someone who decays through the entire film, and that's very visible in many, many different stages. Before we even begin that stuff, though, we get an image of danger to let us know just how bad this could be. Rather than trying to, uh, and this is something a little bit different than when Cronenberg does and a lot of other stuff, although we talked about mm -hmm. the same kind of method in Scanners, we have the baboon. Uh, one of the scenes that everyone remembers from the movie right. because it's so fucking horrific. Um, the baboon goes in, and then what comes out is this mutilated pile of God knows what. And at first, you may not even know what you're looking at, but they make sure you know. They say it's a baboon inside out. Right. So you know now that this is what could happen. This is, and I think it gets even worse than Inside Out Jeff Goldblum, but it, it lets you know that things could get at the very least this bad, so he can't just jump into the machine. You know ultimately that this is the point that too much moving in the wrong direction will get you to. So he lets you know that there's your, uh, there's your timeline of right. decay, I guess. Sure. If movies could have a roadmap for how diseased and decay the body becomes, that's what it looks like right there. It looks like an inside-out baboon. So first comes the hair, and he gives this excuse that's uh, insightful to you know one of the things that's so effective about the makeup job and about the body horror stuff. He talks about how, you know, when you get older, you grow some hair. It's not a big deal. So the fly is going to be a constant metaphor for aging throughout mm -hmm. the rest of the film. Right. Uh, on top of being disgusting and terrifying, it's also going to remind you that these are also the effects that people suffer as they get older. And that's just, that's kicking someone when they're down. Yeah. You're already going, oh, terrifying. Ew, gross. And then Jeff Goldblum's coming in and nudging you in the side and, and going, you know what? Your teeth are going to fall out when you get old, though. That's really going to happen to you. So after the hair, we get the loss of pieces of his body, uh, some of his teeth. The next time he sees her, he says that, you know, he won't be tested. He doesn't want to see scientists. He doesn't want to get help from anybody because he doesn't want to be, uh, you know, what does he say? Another toothless guy complaining about his hair falling out. Right. Again, some more of that like old people stuff. Some more of that uh, people who are sick. You might even make a parallel to something like you could make that parallel to any kind of terminal disease. He doesn't want to associate himself with the victim of a terminal disease. He doesn't want to think he is that. And she leaves, and every time she comes back, he gets worse. It's another layer of the incredible, incredible makeup job. As Mr. Practical Effects on this show, I mean, this right. has got to be one of your oh, highest yeah. Yeah, makeup sure. jobs well, of all time. Yeah, sure. it's right up there with the thing. Is yeah. If you're going to do monsters, it's a very difficult task to do monsters that don't look like people in suits right. and don't look like robots. And the thing and the fly are some of the best examples of how to do that. For sure. Paralleling all of these different stages he goes through in his transformation, you also have these kind of mental states that he's in. Uh, the first time you talk to him, it's just denial, you know, with the hair. Mm -hmm. He's talking about, oh, there's just some hair on my back. It's not a big deal. She tries to cut it. He probably knows that something fucked. I mean, he's got 
weird growths on yeah, his back. Sure. He's got to know those are there. He's just saying, oh, it's not a big deal. And then that turns into him, you know, he lies about it long enough that he fools himself. Right. He has superpowers now. Yeah. You know, hey, you should jump into this pod. It is awesome. I have this great strength. It has purified me. It's well, taken yeah. it's taken all the toxins out of my it body. It does it does make sense in there in that way though. He's mm-hmm. kind of saying, you know, everything's genetically reconfigured and so in a sense everything is taken apart and put back together in the right, optimal right. fashion. And so any any, you know, waste that the body may have built up, that's how we die, okay? Mm-hmm. We die because our bodies are imperfect, our organs eventually fail, maybe not straight up stop working but they eventually they stop wear being down able, our bodies wear down one of your organs will stop working you know your die. heart stops your liver fails and so he's figuring you get hit by a truck he's figuring by teleporting by using the telepod you're kind of pulling your your atoms apart all the waste kind of falls out because it's not human <laughs> stuff yeah, i guess and then you get reconfigured completely wasteless not without a waste, but without waste in your body. Oh, your science is getting as bad as William Hurt's at this point. So she returns again. This is after they've separated. They don't want anything to do with each other because she's afraid to go in the pod. When she returns, though, he's fearful. Uh, while she was gone, he had time to come to terms with it. He, he wasn't putting on a show for anyone anymore. Right. He said, look at these things that are happening to me. The evidence became such a burden that he had to consider the truth. And so he starts that begging phase. He starts the the help me line that's uh-huh. iconic from the original fly, the one with Vincent Price, but not Vincent Price as the fly. And he's just saying over and over, you know, you have to do something. I don't know what ha- what's happening to my body. I need some kind of help. But of course she leaves. She comes back. And then we're back to it's not so bad. He's once again accepted it. At this point, it's not denial. It's that he's given in. Mm-hmm. He realizes that there's no helping him. She left and she came back and she has no new information for this guy. He doesn't want to see anybody. So it's just, I'm becoming a monster. I'm transforming into something else. Hey, you know what? Maybe being a monster is not so bad. Right. What's wrong with that? Well, then the next step is he kind of goes, oh, also, if you keep showing up, I might kill you. Yeah. He starts rambling about bug politics, and it's this bug great politics, scene yeah. where you watch and you are glued to him. Yeah. He's speaking. He is this deformed hybrid of a organic creature. Yeah, you can't see the Jeff Goldblum that has – Jeff Goldblum's one of those guys you know his acting style. Right. You could do a Jeff sure. Goldblum impression right. because of the very distinct style he has. And he is invisible under all of that makeup. And you're glued to him, and he's talking absolute nonsense. Yeah. Whenever I watch it, that scene comes up, I forget how it ends, and I go, I don't remember what he means by this, but I know that by the end of it, it all makes sense to me. And it makes sense because Gina Davis's character goes, you're not making any sense. (laughs) Yeah. And you go, oh, okay, so it's not just me. Yeah, right. He's completely lost it. He's barely even a coherent creature. I think it's the last flicker of light. I think it's him saying what he's trying to get out in those words is get away from me. Eventually this fly is just going to completely take over. Instinct's going to take over. And like you said, I'm going to attack you. Uh, So he's saying this is the last, you know, bug politics, although it takes him forever to try and get anything coherent out. Uh, If you want to make sense out of that jumbled mess is that bugs don't have politics. They're they don't think You know, that's all of the jumble words coming out are just trying to get to the point that he's showing rather than telling. He's just not fucking thinking. He's losing all rationality. He's going to be unrecognizable. She should just fucking take off. And she does. And he chases her down. He has this uh, this final mental transformation Mm -hmm. anyways, where he thinks, all right, you know what? I have one last chance to get rid of Brundlefly and. And maybe if I merge some more human DNA in here, it'll slow the process. I can start thinking more clearly right. again. I don't know exactly what his plan is, but uh, it's probably a terrible plan. Yeah, well, in in a hor- hor- one of the most horrifying moments of the film, he comes shattering through the hospital oh, God, window, yeah, right. grabs her King Kong style, yeah, and just carries say, her yeah. out. And essentially, essentially, he says, don't kill my baby. It's all that's left of me. Right. He's kidnapping unborn babies at right. this point. That's and, how far it's gone. And that desire to keep his lineage alive, the lineage that he ruined, eventually changes into get in this pod with me. If there's more human DNA, it'll uh, minimalize the ratio of human to fly. And since you guys are more human than me, we'll be like, 
a three people yeah. person. Three people on a fly. By absorbing the other humanity, it'll push the fly stuff out a little bit. Yeah. Somehow, Veronica isn't okay with that plan. Huh. So she's fighting that. And, and so we've reached the end of the film here. And if you aren't familiar with Cronenberg stuff, you would probably think, all right, this has gotten about as bad as it's going to get. From here, I mean, they're going to shoot the fly in the face, the police break down the door, sure. who knows what happens. Shit's fucked but up, and yeah. it's just going it, to, we have to wind down at this point. Yeah, right. We've already reached the climax. Look how disturbing things have gotten. But you know that Cronenberg always has that last moment. He is never content not to go out without a bang. And the bang, especially in his old stuff and his 80s stuff, means being fucking disgusting or uh, even just images that will not, they're burned in your mind forever. It's horrendous. It's stuff that you your jaw remains open during the entirety of the end of this film. Yeah, I, you get the dissolved. So when he attacks the Ellis character, you have the dissolved stump of a hand. It's swimming in this, this, it's just a milky, bloody stump. It's disgusting. And then the leg. And I mean, that is cringeworthy enough sure. right there. That was enough for us to both start going, uh, and that sound didn't really stop until uh-huh. the credits came out. But that's not the end of it. I mean, his jaw comes off, his body just starts rapidly his falling eyes pop apart. Out. Yeah, the eyes popping out is and awful. And he turns into a, a more fly-esque creature. Yeah, and so now you're thinking, all right, he's made the full transformation. He's the fly. This is not going to get any worse. Fact. But that's not the fact. Then he goes in the teleporter, and Brundlefly merges with teleporter. Just one more thing to make it uh, just a little bit more awful sure. before... I mean, that's how they defeat him. Right. He becomes uh, one with the teleporter yeah. as well. But that means he's still around long enough to cry out this last uh, kill me. Well, yeah. Essentially, he comes crawling out of the pod, merged with machine. Yeah. He's, he's a useless. He is an absolutely useless organism. Yeah. And he grabs the end of the shotgun and he can't speak anymore. Yeah, right. And he just puts it on his head and oh. you go, oh, please, why didn't you shoot him before he did that? <laughs> yeah. Everybody would have been happy. We wouldn't right. know that he still had emotions. Yeah. We could have accepted that he was some weird He's a fly. monster. It's gone. But we want to move through our stages of grief at this point. But there's still some Brundle in there. There's yeah. still some Jeff Goldblum. And so the film blows his head off. Finally, we get, I mean, it, then, and that's relieving. Yeah. We get the head, the head explosion from another Cronenberg film that was one of the most horrendous things. In this, we're begging for a head yeah, explosion. Yeah, we want it. We want it so bad. And it happens, and we go, okay, whew, time to relax. But no, it's just credits. That's how it ends. Yeah. End of the fucking film. That's the last image that you are left with is that disturbing. We need we need a hug at this point. We need a pat on the back. We need Cronenberg to, you know, to push the curtains aside and say, all right, everything is fine now. We're all back in the real world. But the last thing we got was a mutated fly basically begging for his own death. If he could have committed suicide, he would have. It's just so awful in the best possible way the word awful has ever been meant. All right, come on. That wasn't so bad. We did an all right no, job yeah, with that I'm show. Surprised. I think that, us. that worked out pretty well. Can we just never... Warn me. Next time we set up a schedule, if we're about to do a movie that is the most popular talked about thing ever, and I will warn you if we're going to do a movie that I have not seen in forever, okay. and let's just try and never pair those back to back ever right, again. that sounds like a blast. I think we have a surprise for our audience oh, we coming have a surprise up next for time. our audience. So we have a website. It's doublefeatureshow.com. If you go on there, you will not find the surprise. You could email us, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, but I think you know where I'm going with this. You're not going to get the surprise out of there either. If you donate, we'll give you the surprise, but you don't need to do that. We have something coming up next week, which people, I think they've missed it. Yeah. What are we doing next time on the show, Michael? We're doing Wishmaster and Wishmaster 2 and Wishmaster 3 and 4. Oh, one of those it's happening again i guess so all right so it's a baby one but it is a killapalooza baby steps people we're bringing them back this is going to mark the return at the same rate we used to have them we're going to start doing them once every i don't know how often we had them before but the schedules line right up so uh they'll be coming and we're going to start with the small one and work our way back up but i think we have a lot to talk about with wishmaster awesome watch more fucking film bye How far? Where do you want to go from here? Do you want to go into the pseudoscience thing really quick? Yeah, yeah, really quick. Well, you should talk about Dolphin Man.
<laughs> you know, that thing. Hold on, let me do Timothy Leary. <laughs> 